most respected <coughs> Professor Anand Mishaji, the head of the Department of Philosophy, PHU. My good friend, Professor P. N. Tiwari Ji, Professor P. R. Bach, Professor Baleshwar Yadav, <coughs> Professor Joshna Stevetsa, Professor Alok, and my respected colleagues and students of this department, and those who have joined this lecture by online, especially my good friend, Professor G. P. Das, Dr. Alok Tandon, and other friends. At the outset, I'm grateful to this department, especially to Professor Anand Mishraji, for, uh, first of all, tolerating me for all these uh, months, I should say, because he has extended uh, the invitation in last year, that is August uh, 2022, but I have been somehow postponing, postponing this program. And uh, two weeks ago also, I told him that uh, if you could postpone it to the end of this month, I would be happy. But he said nothing doing because we are going to wind up this. <laughs> Either you come or we'll drop the program. So I thought that I should visit the department for two reasons. One is great stalwarts have taught this department. We have been very much benefited by their teachings. And also I would like to have the darshan of Kashi Vishwanath. In fact, I told Anandji that I'll visit your department on one condition that you should make, a, a, you know, a provision for me to visit Kashi Vishwanath temple and uh, he said definitely you will visit the temple and you will have the darshan of Kashi Vishwanath. So I am here. Uh, friends, uh, this uh, lecture is Jail Mehta lecture. Some of you are aware of the name Jail Mehta because he is the one who is specialized in uh, Heidegger's philosophy as well as uh, in the field of uh, Indian hermeneutics. In fact, uh, Heidegger said that it is Jail Mehta who has understood his philosophy, that is Heidegger's philosophy, in a correct way. So Jail Mehta is a well-known scholar both in Indian and Western tradition. And moreover, his field of specialization is uh, not only Heidegger, but also hermeneutics. I am also interested in hermeneutics. So I feel uh, uh, proud to talk about uh, the significance of uh, hermeneutics in the context of uh, Swaraj, the concept of Swaraj or the idea of Swaraj, following the methodology which uh, Professor Jail Mehta has offered in the context of hermeneutics. Uh, friends, what I would like to do is that <coughs> Swaraj, the concept of Swaraj or the idea of Swaraj, is not only a political concept, but also a philosophical concept. Or I would say that we can extend the scope of Swaraj to both the cultural as well as, as, well as a philosophical discourse. So what we can do is, we can contextualize the concept of Swaraj in the cultural and philosophical discourse and see how far it is helpful to us, how far it is uh, valid or how far it is acceptable to us in the present philosophical context. So in this uh, approach, I would like to draw some parallels between Gandhi's uh, concept of Swaraj, that is actually Gandhi's uh, understanding of Hind Swaraj, and uh, K.C. Bhattacharya's well-known article, Swaraj in Ideas. 
So what we need is now to reinterpret the concept of culture in the philosophical context. This means there is a need for us to revisit culture which can give us a new dimension to the philosophical problems. It is not uh, my point to say that simply we have to cling on to culture because simply clinging on to culture without making any deviation or any, any revisit would take us to orthodoxy. I'm not supporting the notion of orthodoxy. On the other hand, I would like to state that there is a need for us, or I would say the urgent need for us to revisit the notion of culture, and it has to be interpreted hermeneutically so that it can give new meaning to us. One can contextualize uh, in Swaraj or KCB's uh, Swaraj in ideas in philosophical discourse, especially the contemporary Indian philosophical discourse, and see whether there is something called Indianness in it. Because in the contemporary philosophy, quite often it is said that Indian philosophers have lost their direction. So whether there is something called Indianness in Indian philosophical discourses is very much essential. This is very much uh, important in the context of a uh, contemporary Indian philosophy. In the colonial India, we could see how the Western culture tried to invade Indian culture and to some extent they were also successful. One area of interference is the introduction of uh, English in Indian universities and colleges, which has been used as a medium of instruction. Hence, uh, this uh, linguistic division, that is English as well as non or English versus non-English, made us to write or rewrite some of our concepts in an alien language that is English. Whether to write it in our language or foreign language is very much uh, important. So it is wrongly assumed that writing in English is a progressive approach. The imitation, no doubt, has helped us to some extent, but also we have to take into account uh, the creativity of the individual or indigenous thinkers is lost by writing it in English. So Gandhi has used this concept of Swaraj in a broader perspective. I would like to quote Gandhi. He says, when I speak of cultural subjection, I do not mean the assimilation of an alien culture. That assimilation need not be an evil. It may be possibly necessary for healthy progress. And in any case, it does not mean a lapse or freedom. So there is a cultural subjection only once traditional caste of ideas and sentiments is superseded without comparison or competition by a new caste represented, representing an alien culture. This is what uh, Subhijivan Bhattacharya says. Further, Casey Bhattacharya says, that slavery has entered in our every, in, in very soul. And his method of approach is something novel because he said, let us think uh, boldly in our own concepts, in our own terms. So which means we have to evolve a living culture suited to the times of our native genius. One can compare here, K.C. Bhattacharya's uh, Swaraj and ideas with that of uh, Gandhi's uh, Hind Swaraj. Hind Swaraj is a revolutionary text and similarly Swaraj and ideas also a revolutionary text. So there can be many parallels which we can draw between uh, Gandhi's uh, idea of uh, 
Hind Swaraj and uh, the concept of uh, Swaraj, which has been emphasized by K.C. Bhattacharya. In fact, in the year uh, 1984, the Indian Philosophical Quarterly, that is the department uh, publication of uh, Pune University, has brought out a special volume uh, on uh, KCB's uh, approach to Swaraj and Ideas. This is Swaraj and Ideas Revisited, wherein many scholars have contributed substantially for uh, re-understanding the concept of uh, Swaraj of KCB. One article uh, is very fascinating. Of course, all articles are very fascinating. One article which I would like to mention here is Yes, uh, Deshpande's, Professor Deshpande's uh, a juxtaposition of KCB and Gandhi. This was published in IPQ in the year 1984. And he makes a comparison between Gandhi and KC Bhattacharya. And uh, there are two uh, parallels which uh, Professor Deshpande could uh, draw. I would like to quote him. There is no gain saying the fact that this Western culture which means an entire system of ideas and sentiments has been simply imposed upon us. This is what the KCB says, according to Deshpande. Then Deshpande compares this with uh, Gandhi's understanding of Hind Swaraj. She says, this is passage from uh, Gandhi's uh, Hind Swaraj, carried away by the flood uh, of Western thought, we came to the conclusion that without weighing pros and cons, that we should give this kind of education to all the people. Further, Gandhi says that we want the English rule without the English man. You want the tiger's nature, but not the tiger. That is to say, you would make India English. This is not the Swaraj I want. This is what Gandhi says. There can be many parallels, just now I said, can be drawn between Swaraj and ideas of KCB and Gandhi's understanding of Swaraj. But it is fascinating to note uh, that how uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore reacted to Gandhi's understanding of uh, Swaraj. With uh, regard to Swaraj, he said that uh, there is a need for us to revisit uh, Gandhian approach of uh, Swaraj. And uh, there is an interesting debate between Gandhi and Tagore, uh, which clearly show that uh, the terms which have been used, that is Swaraj and Sudesi, do not have a common meaning for both these uh, uh, thinkers. The interpretation differs. So it is interesting to see how we can include KCB also in the context of uh, Swaraj, of uh, Gandhi, and the idea of Swaraj according to uh, Tagore. Tagore felt that uh, Gandhi's ideology is not only short-sighted, but also incoherent. In the concept of Swaraj, a political idea has to be drawn. And to have a political freedom, one can see how philosophers like KCB use this in the context of a cultural as well as, as, well as philosophical uh, text. The one interesting book I would like to mention, which was published in the year 1909, is Hind Swaraj or Indian Home Rule by Gandhi, wherein he discussed the notion of Swaraj, modern civilization and mechanism. Gandhi explains how the European civilization predominate everybody. Of course, this book was banned in the next year, that is 1910 by the British. So it is this book uh, is in the form of a dialogue a dialogue between the reader and the editor. And uh, three important points are discussed by Gandhi here. One is uh, home rule is a self-rule. Then Indian independence is only possible through passive resistance. And thirdly, India will never become free unless it rejects the Western civilization itself. Now, Gandhi felt uh, that modernity or modernism has created a lot of problems for India. And he argued that uh, modernity or modernism has promised many things, but it did not fulfill those things. For this reason, Gandhi wanted liberation from modernity itself. There is a colonial domination in modernity 
and modernity according to gandhi is a threat to india and its citizens why because the concept of uh, democracy development liberty and individuality or individualism all these are misrepresented by modernity according to gandhi so there is a need for us to re understand the notion of uh, modernity as it was explained by gandhi and other thinkers so gandhi correctly understood that all those promises which have been given by modernity or modernism were wrong totally wrong and they are ill founded it came with good and bad and the imaginary benefit which have been anticipated is not uh, ready so gandhi was right in saying that modernity modernity and its nature is uh, immoral and because of that individual freedom is lost so in fact there are modern scholars like uh, 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 like like uh, uh, habermas and others who argue that uh, modernity is an unfinished project of course many postmodernists argue that uh, modernity could bring a uh, lot of uh, uh, ills that is uh, they they could not solve many problems as uh, gandhi felt that there was they gave lot of promises but uh, modernity could not fulfill those promises so it has to be understood that modernity is both uh, the structure of power it represents power and also the mode of power so as structure of power it is an ideology bounded with western domination and white democracy as a mode of power it is implemented by multiple actors and subjectivities that are hierarchically distributed which uh, we can see dualism such as <laughs> europe and others west and east north and south metropolis and uh, colonies so this uh, demarcation very clearly shows this is how modernity promotes uh, his uh, own uh, uh, interest in fact uh, uh, edward said in his well known book uh, well known book orientalism talks about how there is a very clear cut uh, uh, distinction between uh, 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 i mean uh, colonized and uh, the the colonial rule the co colonizer and the colonized so they wanted to suppress the west wanted to suppress uh, the colonized people by saying that you are inferior that you don't have the knowledge so this kind of a uh, distinction was very much uh, presented in uh, as uh, many of the uh, western uh, philosophers argue that uh, modernity is a result uh, it produced were not good because uh, rationalism is said it said uh, is something very beautiful and it is something which is remarkable and which can once it uh, is implemented then the entire world will change but did not happen in fact uh, modernism has reduced uh, human beings uh, to a machine so man is reduced to machine so industrial revolution did not give a solution to human being so we have to see the context in which uh, modernism has emerged and uh, that is the reason why gandhi felt that modernism cannot uh, solve many of our problem so the only alternate model is uh, the swaraj which is a self mastery or the self rule so the self rule alone can uh, bring out uh, a, a radical change in the life of uh, uh, human being or human society in fact i would like to quote sri arabindo uh he says uh, that in the uh, he wrote this in the year 1907 he says i quote him if we do not uh, uh free ourselves from the foreign rule swaraj is meaning uh, meaningless i am afraid we the 30 crores at that time it was 30 crores 30 crores of people will become extinct if we don't practice swaraj swaraj is life it is a nectar and salvation according to arabindo swaraj in a nation which gives a breath of life 
So many contemporary philosophers have emphasized the significance of uh, uh, Suraj. So in this context, we have to see how we can relate it to uh, uh, philosophy. This is my uh, major concern. So I would like to see how Suraj, the concept of Suraj, which has been developed by Gandhi, has a close uh, link with uh, close link with the uh, Swaraj and ideas of uh, K.C. Bhattacharya. And here, I would like to, as I said in the beginning, I would like to use the cultural model or a critique of culture, which can solve, according to me, many problems that we are facing today. Uh, one, one interesting philosopher, I think uh, all of you know about that uh, great philosopher, uh, the cultural anthropologist, G.C. Pondé, uh, G.C. Pondé, in uh, one of his interesting books, An Approach to Indian Culture and Civilization, says that uh, there is a need for us to make a distinction between nature and uh, culture. I quote him, whereas nature has no history, culture as value seeking is inherently historical as it is bound up with a social and symbolic tradition within which uh, its dialectical and development process are operated, unquote. So, what is the significance of this statement? That uh, G.C. Pandey tries to argue that India, which is a great nation which consists of a rich tradition of ethical values and cultural background, will always see the means and end together. In India, we see the plurality of culture, it always appreciates each and every culture, whether it is small or big, sharing each culture its due. So culture adopts itself to the situation. It takes into account the changes that are taking place outside. It is slow but steady. So culture unites men into one cultural group. The development of many culture is due to various causes uh, like uh, physical uh, habitants and then resources which are outside possibilities inherent in various uh, uh, areas of activity which are inner. So, which means the inner and outer approach uh, is very much essential, uh, which play a dominant role in shaping the nature of uh, culture. So, this uh, approach to culture will help us to understand that culture is the guardian of the people. Culture endows people with uh, their identity and uh, Pandey emphasizes that there are various kinds of approaches, at least he mentions three kinds of approaches to culture, a scientific culture, scientific approach, historical and metaphysical. And these uh, approaches clearly show that there is something very much implicit in the culture. In fact, uh, culture has two aspects. One is uh, the core and the periphery. The core of uh, the culture or tradition cannot be changed. It is always permanent. Uh, and when you try to change the core aspect, then it no more exists as culture. But on the periphery, you can make certain changes or uh, you, we have been making some changes in the periphery. So this is uh, uh, okay. But uh, if we simply follow the culture without questioning it, without uh, allowing us to uh, modify or re-modify or without allowing, uh, allowing some changes in that, then we are identifying culture with orthodoxy. That is, uh, the culture and uh, orthodoxy are not opposed to each other. Orthodoxy is a term which is used by many philosophers in order to show that we cling on to the past without questioning them. But uh, we should understand the fact that India lives in two or more conceptual worlds. One is uh, we follow the great traditions which have been handed over to us by the mythological past, which helps us to grow in the future. And secondly, the modern science and technology, which has been playing a more or less role in the development. But India is trying to uh, strike a balance between these two. One is it follows uh, the ancient uh, values, which are very much essential. At the same time, we also allow to accept uh, uh, the uh, changes that are taking place through science. 
but what we need is we have to develop alternate world views this is what i would like to say we want to develop alternate world views alternate metaphysics for the basis of uh, uh, technology as which means there is a need for us to revisit uh, the culture as philosophy and also the methodology which we have been adopting so what does this mean this means this is what i would like to state uh, how one can re uh, visit or re modify or uh, reinvent uh, the cultural base of our country so this means we must re examine our cultural heritage and tradition in the life in the light of our present situation so tradition is always hermeneutical and accommodate some new interpretation and understanding so it doesn't mean that simply we have to accept the culture as it is wherever necessary we can say we can make certain amendments or changes so that it can suit our purpose so that is the reason why i am using the hermeneutical concept as in the case of uh, jail meta and uh, what i am trying to say is uh, tradition is always hermeneutical and it accommodates <coughs> new interpretation and understanding this uh, reconstruction means the reconstructing the present categories of uh, knowledge man's mode of being in the world helps a person to evaluate a tradition so we must be in a position to evaluate our own tradition so it is not possible for a person simply to follow the tradition but he has to evaluate or revisit the tradition the world of historicity will have an impact on the tradition and it accepts evaluation and reinterpretation this does not mean that we are revolting against the tradition but interpreting them in the context of present historicity the cultural world which one belongs to allows a radical interpretation of the tradition this sort of interpretation teaches a way of looking at the tradition afresh from a new perspective which will suit for our present situation and this explains how a particular person is placed in the surrounding world or tradition though his physical world is supported by scientific and technological society so every man is placed in a particular tradition or culture which cannot be avoided so this means we need alternate ways of uh, thinking for example philosophers the futurists and others and others who are interested in the future of technology and thus with the future of culture would be beneficial by a dialogue with the alternate world of uh, indian culture in which alternate base of uh, knowledge and life can be evolved so the western or the technological society is based to a great extent your qualitative or instrumental values now they have understood their mistake and now they are turning towards india wherein we talk about uh, uh, a life which is uh, full of uh, values and ethical principles so our mode of understanding the human values which is uh, based on our ancient uh, uh, values which are given by our ancient rishis uh, sages and saints have to be evaluated in the context of uh, the technology as well as uh, the hermeneutical tradition now the west is now in search of a quality of life quality of life life like that of uh, india it has understood the emptiness of the quantitative approach which uh, they have been following so this uh, mode of understanding in fact helps us to understand the traditional values and culture which has been playing a very important role so this uh, approach i would say is uh, the philosophy of culture which is uh, re uh, invented or revisited by using hermeneutics as a mode of uh, understanding and tradition as i said is always hermeneutical and it always accommodates some new interpretation and understanding here i would like to uh, quote uh, uh the text bhagavad gita for example uh there should be uh or there would be different ways of approaching the indian tradition but the inner meaning should not be lost this is very important you can approach the culture by using different methodology whether it is a hermeneutical methodology or the post uh, 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 modern understanding of culture 
all these are fine but the inner meaning of culture cannot be lost for example uh, this is an example given by professor late professor suresh chandra he says a text like bhagavad gita has different approaches it is said that according to gandhi gita is a move in dharma that is a move in religion and morality but for bakim chandra chatterji gita is a move in history you see two different approaches in other words gandhi never placed gita in the history whereas bankim did for bankim krishna was a historical person and mahabharata was a real war but gandhi believed that this sort of understanding would deprive deprive the gita of its status as a religious text of the hindus the question whether the text is historical or religious one is not very important in this context what is important is the truth conveyed by the text bankim tries to emphasize the fact that his historical interpretation would substantiate the truth namely the text has some purpose for which it is written that this means whether it is a historical or a religious a text which has some sacredness in it must be understood by the role it plays in the life world of the situation similarly the mythologies must be interpreted in the life world situation because they cannot be dismissed as something nonsensical which many uh, um, many people are doing i don't want to mention the name the story is mentioned in it they need not be true right but the inner meaning which is conveyed must be understood to preserve the tradition one who in fact uh, um, long back uh, shankara uh, 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 quotation i would like to quote he says shankara says one who does not know the tradition even if he is well versed in all the sciences he is to be ignored as a fool this is what shankara says similarly jawaharlal nehru says today india swings between the blind adherence of her old customs and a slavish imitation of a foreign ways in either of these can she find relief or life or growth true culture derives its inspiration from every corner of the world but it is home grown this is very important the last word is very important this is what jawarlal nehru says now let us see how we can extend or we can apply this uh, in philosophical uh, debate or in the philosophical discourse this is very important because as a student of philosophy i feel that the concept of swaraj should be applied in the philosophical discourse because we are quite often uh, uh, mesmerized i would say by the western tradition or the western uh, methods of doing philosophy so philosophy consists of reflection of man's experience in relation to himself this is how one can define philosophy but a reflection to one's own experience is based on what type of philosophy one is subscribing to this is very important what type of a philosophy is one one is practicing or sub, subscribing to by type of philosophy we mean whether one is rooted in one's own tradition or borrowed tradition of the west if a person develops his reflection on a borrowed tradition then one must see how far this will help can we simply ignore our own tradition and adopt the tradition which is completely alien to us professor kcb is uh, statement is very important in his article swaraj and ideas he says he makes a distinction between the cultural subjection and cultural assimilation he explains the dangers of cultural subjection and argues that it is a suppression of one's own traditional caste of ideas which i mentioned already and he says that it is high time for us to come back to our own philosophy that is he says the need to make our own distinctive estimates and evaluations of foreign philosophy most of the time we are simply carried away by the methodology which is adopted by the foreign philosophers but, uh, he also rejects kcb also rejects the hybridization of ideas and patchwork of ideas of different cultures and suggests that one need not accept the foreign valuations or appraisals of our own culture 
this is what uh, I meant when when I was uh, reacting to Professor uh, uh, Pierre Butts' uh, uh, presentation that how you know we uh, Radha Krishna, for example, used uh, wherever necessary, comparing it with Western tradition. Of course, that was the need of the world. So, okay, what KCB says is that uh, one need not accept the foreign valuations or appraisals of our culture. He was very much supporting the need for translation of all foreign ideas into our native ideas and for thinking in our own concepts to be able to think productively, productively in our own accounts. He says, I quote him, I quote KCP, we can think effectively only when we think in terms of indigenous ideas that pulsate in the life and mind of the masses, unquote. The need to return to the cultural stratum of a real Indian people and to evolve a culture along with them suited to the times was emphasized by KCP. And of course, thinkers like uh, Aurobindo and Radha Krishna also express the same idea. Radha Krishna says, we cannot cut ourselves off from the springs of our life. Further, Radha Krishna says, there is nothing wrong in observing the culture of other people. Only we must enhance, rise and purify the elements we take over, fuse them with the best in our own. Our philosophical tradition should be the basis of our present philosophical approach. This means we must think in our own concepts and stick to our own idea. It is uh, clear that uh, there has been a call from our philosophers, our own philosophers, to retain Indian identity. This is very, very important, retaining Indian identity and to make philosophy more indigenous. But let us see whether it reflects the views of the majority of philosophers in India and also see whether there is any real need for it. So, Thinkers like Sri Aurobindo, Gandhi, uh, KCP and many others have pointed out that there is a need for us to rethink uh, our own philosophy and we have to think in indigenous terms. But there are others who say that uh, this approach is uh, no, uh, not needed and uh, this is not the view that is maintained by majority of philosophers in India. Now let us see which is very important. Now, I would like to quote another important thinker, Deen Dayal Ubadhyaya, who says that we must think of uh, Indian identity or national identity without which independence has no meaning. During foreign rule, our identity was suppressed and the main problem for this is the neglect of the self. I quote uh, uh, Deen Dayal Ji, as long as we are unaware of our national identity, we cannot recognize and develop all our potentialities, unquote. So, this is something very much uh, uh, important in the context of contemporary Indian philosophy. Why I am talking about this is, uh, long back, uh, Professor Suresh Chandra uh, wrote one article wherein he said there are three kinds of philosophers in India, right? Three kinds of philosophers who are doing philosophy in India. One is a uh, great philosophers uh, who are uh, Sanskrit scholars, who are uh, very good in uh, the text, but unfortunately we are not able to utilize their scholarship because they talk you know, only in Sanskrit, they write only in Sanskrit, and we don't have the competency to understand them. So we are not unfortunately benefited by the Sanskrit scholars. Though their, their knowledge is vast, especially in Varanasi I know that very, great Sanskrit pundits, we can sit at their feet and learn and listen to them. But unfortunately, we are not able to utilize their knowledge and scholarship. So this first kind of uh, philosophers in India, according to Surajita. Then he also says there is a second kind of philosopher who write only on Western philosophy in India. One example is uh, uh, Professor uh, R. Sundararajan of Pune University. He wrote only on Western philosophy. Towards the end, of course, he was trying to come back to Indian philosophy, but it was too late. So he wrote only on Indian philosophy. And Suresh Chandra, of course, he didn't mention, uh, 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 what's his name? Um, Sundarajan's name, but he says there are some philosophers who write only on 
Western philosophy in India, and they are not recognized in the West. Please note that. We write on Wittgenstein. In fact, I had the problem. I, I worked on Wittgenstein, and when I was talking in a seminar, one German uh, professor, uh, this happened in Satinilam, Father Alok is there. His name is that uh, uh, professor name is Herbert Herring. He stood up and said, do you know German? I said, unfortunately, I don't know. Then he said, you can't understand Wittgenstein. I said, why? I said, I understood and wrote my thesis and got the degree. Then he said, no, no, no. You have to be rooted in our tradition. That means he says that I must know German and German, not only German language, right? German culture. So, and uh, there were many, you know, that, uh, that uh, what is that? Uh, this uh, kind of uh, partiality is always there. And uh, we are not recognized in the West. So why should we write in the West? And uh, as far as I know, there are few scholars who are uh, well recognized in the West. J.L. Mehta is one, of course. And uh, J.N. Mohanty is another, but uh, uh, he settled in foreign countries. So yes. then there are thinkers like J.N. Mohanty and others, sorry, uh, P.K. Matilal and others. But P.K. Matilal also, please note that he taught only in religious department. So unfortunately, that racism is there and they are not able to accept our contribution if we write something on West. So this is a second kind of philosopher. Then there is a third kind of philosopher according to Suresh Nara. He says, those philosophers who write both on Indian and Western, what do they do? They take the methodology of the West, right? Then apply it to Indian tradition and see how rich our Indian tradition is. Because most of the time we have the habit of praising our Indian uh, philosophy, we say, oh, that is great, okay. But you have to substantiate that. The sense that we are in no way inferior to you. For example, there are many methodologies uh, uh, have come. For example, when we talk about uh, Western phenomenology, the Indian phenomenologists have emerged. There are many thinkers like Jair Mohanty, Professor R. Balasubramaniam, they have been writing on Indian phenomenology. In fact, they argue that Advaita, for example, is a transcendental phenomenology. So this means there is a new way of approaching Indian philosophy. And also hermeneutics. When hermeneutics developed as a new mode of philosophizing in the West uh, in the 20th century, Father Alok knows. So those uh, methodologies were very much uh, uh, appreciated. But if you look at our own Sastra, especially the Prasthanatriyas, we can understand that uh, we too have been practicing this uh, uh, hermeneutical tradition. Only the name differs. Because uh, hermeneutics means interpretation of the text. This is what we have been doing in uh, Vedanta. So the methodologies are uh, uh, one and the same. Deconstruction also is very much present in, in, in Indian philosophy. So what I'm trying to say is by following the footsteps of uh, uh, Professor Suresh and the third kind of philosophers, they have been uh, uh, substantially contributing something very important and uh, Suresh Chandra says this, this kind of philosophers are very much essential because they give something new. Okay. So uh, now what is the situation or what was the situation some 50 years ago and now? Because here you can see the idea of Swaraj. Because as I said my idea my approach is to see how this idea of Swaraj or Swaraj in ideas can be extended to philosophy by taking the methodology of Gandhi as well as the KCP. Now when Indian philosophy was dwindling under the yoke of British rule and English missionaries with a view to exposing the weakness of Indian thought, this is what many British uh, uh, people have done, especially the missionaries. English missionaries with a view to exposing the weakness of Indian thought and culture and establishing superiority of their own, writing books and translating a number of religion, religious and philosophical works in Sanskrit, a new way of consciousness was created in India. The coming of the European and the establishment of a vast British empire on Indian soil in the 19th century, no doubt, opened a new chapter in the cultural and political history of India. The strong impact of Western culture, religion, education, politics, economics, law and order, its science and technology on our ancient culture and religion, polity and economic structure also resulted in the creation of a void in the life and thought of the Indian of the period. So what happened is that there was too much uh, Western uh, uh, approach 
So the Indian, a common Indian, was trying to lose uh, his uh, grip, right? So because you know the, it, it, everything was dominated by the foreign uh, uh, methodology. So there was a conflict between his, his uh, I mean, common man's traditional values and the alien cultural pattern. For a time, everything Indian was considered inferior before the superior civilization of the ruler. Just as the British market had closed uh, to Indian uh, commodities and self-sufficient village uh, economy was brought to a standstill, similarly in the cultural sphere, you can see how Gandhian methodology could be adopted here. Gandhi has applied this Swaraj in the context of political, whereas uh, in philosophy we can apply it to in the cultural sphere. So I'll read it once again. Just as the British market has closed to Indian commodities and self-sufficient village economy was brought to a standstill. Similarly, in the cultural sphere, the British and the Western ideas came to reign supreme over Indian ideas and a deliberate and systematic attempt was made to cripple Indian ideas. So the Orientalists have made an attempt to revive Indian philosophy. But unfortunately, the Indian that was discovered now, the new Indian, in quote, was Indian seen through Western eyes. The Western-oriented Indian intellectual had their visions colored by the Western world. They began to judge, they began to judge Indian concepts in Western terms. This dynamic uh, civilization of the West began to break the age-old Indian traditions and the ideas. At one stage, it was even felt that the ancient Indian civilization would just be replaced by the Western. This was not a genuine renaissance. In a genuine re renaissance, new ideas are absorbed in already living tradition. For example, Kalidas Bhattacharya says, I quote him, what happens in genuine renaissance is that under the impact of some powerful new ideas, people with living tradition adjust those ideas to the tradition. What these English educated Indians did was to understand and interpret the traditional Indian values, Indian philosophy, for that in terms of the ideas that were Western. This is not a real renaissance, says Kalidas Bhattacharya. So, <coughs> Ramon Rai, the father of modern India, emerged during this period, followed by Swami Vivekananda, Swami Ramatirtha, and others. These Western educated Indians saw the plight of their own countrymen who were reluctant to leave their ancestral heritage and embrace the alien cultural patterns and values imposed on them. So the translation of many ancient Sanskrit texts into English by the Orientalists and their publication by the Clarington Press, Oxford, under the general title Sacred Books of the uh, East, help the Indians to know the significance of their own, their rich spiritual heritage. They felt the need to defend it. But they also understood the necessity of accommodating and absorbing certain trends of Western civilization into the fabric of Indian culture without affecting the essential roots uh, basis of the ancient past. So this means in order to suit modern conditions, they sought to revise their ancient pattern of the thought. So they interpreted, for example, the Vedanta text in the light of the ideas stemmed from the West by means of their intuitive experience and offered a necessary ethos best suited for Indian mind. So the West is a symbol of new age as well as new knowledge to Ramon Roy and Vivekananda. Roy, who had his spiritual roots firmly in the Vedanta had a profound knowledge of the great philosophical texts of the West. So different philosophical movements were very much familiar to him. It was he who had put India on the march towards the progress and freedom. So commenting on him, Swami Vivekananda once said, a new life enters India with Ramon Roy. There occurs a new movement in the history of India and there is a general struggle in the dormant atmosphere towards self-possession in several fields of life and knowledge. So Ramon Roy found 
a new method of understanding the philosophical text, especially the Vedantic text, and the translations and the commentaries of uh, Ramon Roy on the ancient scriptures of Vedanta is no match to the commentaries produced by Shankara and Ramanuja. Yet in Roy, one finds elaborate discussion and arguments in the style of uh, Ramanuja and Shankara. So a new methodology has, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, emphasized, has been emphasized by Ram, Ramon Roy and others. So now it is very much essential for us to see how this methodology is really helpful to us. So it is very much uh, important to see whether to argue that the contemporary Indian philosophy has not contributed substantially something for philosophy. This is, that is one criticism because the, it is said that many of the contemporary Indian philosophers, why most of the contemporary Indian philosophers, they have simply interpreted the ancient system and they have not contributed something new. But this criticism is invalid according to me because uh, if we take uh, the contribution, I'll, I'll, I'll quote this passage. Uh, because um, I'll, I'll just finish in five minutes. Um, it has been, it has been uh, argued that after 15th century AD, there is no philosophy in India. This is one criticism. The critics argue that it has uh, produced no new system of thought, right, or, or had created no new philosophical concept. Most of the Indian philosophers were concerned with exposition and interpretation, and only few were aware of the need for creative work. And it is also believed, of course, wrongly, that Indian philosophy ended with the Dvaita Vedanta. The fact that many textbooks on Indian philosophy do not go beyond this proves this. Some hold that the view of Indian, that the approach of Indian philosophy has ended with Udayana, who lived during the 10th century later part. So there are others who believe the contribution of uh, Indian philosophy came to an end by the 18th century. So, there is a need for revival of Indian philosophy and the revival of Indian philosophy received, unfortunately, a severe blow from the World War II, which enabled our Indian philosophers through their contact with America to get uh, uh, new ideas of Western philosophy by bringing them into contact with European philosophy and also American philosophy. So this is a, a methodology which has been adopted by many of our contemporary thinkers and it is said that uh, it is it is asked the question that is asked is this something uh, really remarkable and mohanty's uh, approach is uh, very important here jain mohanty says in india something very basic has changed now we write in english not in sanskrit writing in english cannot be simply an external change it has and will continue to deeply alter our modes of thinking and so this may be partly due to the fact that contemporary Indian philosophers are trying to impress their Western counterpart by presenting an apologetic of their favorite systems of Indian philosophy vis-a-vis -vis Western criticism of them. Rather, Christian Or the contemporary Indian thinkers were trying to construct their own systems of philosophy, which is based on Indian intuition, but present them in the Western God. So there is a need, I feel that there is a need for us to revisit our Indian philosophical tradition. And if Indian philosophy is to uh, develop further, develop further in the sense in order to preserve our own tradition, it is necessary for us to examine the Western philosophy also. Because Western philosophy also has to be seen from Indian perspective, which uh, the foreigners uh, fail to do. Indian philosophers should respond to Western philosophical problems. Philosophers of the East and the philosophers of the West must converse, try to understand each other's thesis, and analyze the arguments and the evidences in support of them. There are and uh, uh, scholars who say that in, uh, uh, in ancient philosophical discourse, there are many areas, many unexplored areas. For example, uh, Jayanta's uh, Nyaya Manjari, Sri Arshas, Kandana Kandana Kadya, they deal with philosophical issues, no doubt. But how much importance is given to this philosophical text? 
because most of the time we will be working or we, we, we are concentrating more on the metaphysical part. So attempts have been made in this direction by great thinkers like B.K. Matila, Jain Mohanty and others. So we must be in a position to understand our own tradition before we take any judgment on them. No doubt Indian philosophy needs a new direction and a radical departure wherever necessary. I quote with this uh, uh, quotation once again from Jain Mohanty. Monty. There must be many changes, sorry, there must be many things that are not for us, that are, sorry, I'll repeat, uh, there must be many things, those that are for us dead and only of antiquarian interest, some again whose interest is only cultural but not philosophical, unquote. This means there is a need for us to revisit our Indian philosophical discourse and see how it can answer the best that's my first observation and secondly we have to see wherever necessary we have to re-modify some of our concepts and if something are not very important we must be bold enough to reject it in this way one can show a new direction to uh, indian philosophy this i would say is swaraj in uh, ideas in the context of a uh, philosophical discourse so I, I would just uh, like conclude by saying, by saying that these are my, my conclusions. One is that in the context of, in the broader framework, uh, both uh, Gandhi and uh, K.C. Bhattacharya have given a new methodology for understanding the Swaraj, the concept of Swaraj, one in the political sphere and another is uh, another in, in the cultural and philosophical discourse. So uh, we can apply the methodology of Gandhi as well as uh, uh, KCP's approach uh, in contemporary Indian philosophy and see whether we need any uh, change in the existing methodology and if we must be bold enough to uh, reject some of the concepts if they are not uh, relevant to us and see how we can update our philosophy. There is no point in simply saying that everything is very much available in Indian philosophy. Of course, everything is available in your philosophy, but you have to present it to the others. That is possible provided you make a, a clear-cut understanding or you revisit our uh, your own philosophy. This is very much essential. And also, this is, uh, this is my uh, last pa point, that uh, we must be in a position to understand Western philosophy in order to uh, understand Indian philosophy better. This, uh, what I mean is that this approach would, uh, first of all, help us to, to throw more light on Indian philosophy and also we can exhibit the Westerners that the so-called new method, contemporary methods or uh, the recent methods which they have developed is very much present in Indian philosophy. And it doesn't mean that simply we have to accept the West or whatever that is given in phenomenology or deconstruction. No, we can, we can see how these elements are present. That's all. We can draw some pa ma parallel and say that this methodology is not something alien to us. So this way, I think, according to me, I may be wrong also. So this method uh, of approach, I think, would uh, would uh, help us to grow. So with this, I thank uh, all of you for giving me. Thank you, sir. You really. Uh, and extensively put the concept of Swaraj, uh, stretching out the fragments from the two great work. One is Gandhi's Hindu Swaraj and the second Swaraj in Ideas of K.C. Bhattacharya. I hope you all would have been enjoying the lecture and we are very much benefited by your thought-provoking ideas. So th thank you once again.